be present, mm -hmm. enjoy the moment. Small steps take us to great places. Every day starts with throwing your legs over the side of the bed and strapping on your shoes, right? Like, yeah. Care, care for others, mm -hmm. care for yourself, care for what you're doing. Not only can you be happier in life, you can, you can make a big difference. What's going on guys? Today I have with me Gary Hall Jr. Gary is an American former competition swimmer who represented the United States at the 1996, 2000 and 2004 Olympics, where he won 10 Olympic medals, five gold, three silver and two bronze. He is a former world record holder in the two relay events. Uh, and I don't really need to say anything else as these records speak for themselves. I welcome the cool, calm and collected Olympic Hall of Famer, Gary Hall Jr. My name's Gary Hall Jr. I swam in three Olympics. I yep. became the first person with type one diabetes to compete and medal in the Olympic games in any sport. I spent a lot of years in the water. Your career in the Olympics, how did you get started with the swimming? I was born into a swimming family. My parents met at a swim meet. My father was from Southern California. My mom was from Cincinnati, Ohio. My yeah. father went on a scholarship to Indiana University. It's a swimming dynasty in the golden era of swimming, late 60s and early 70s. There was a coach there by the name of Doc Councilman. Uh, my father competed in 1968, 1972, and 1976 Olympic Games. Yeah. Uh, held 10 world records, was world swimmer of the year twice, and his most notable achievement um, outside of winning three Olympic medals, two silvers and a bronze, was carrying the flag for the United States in the opening ceremonies of the Olympic mm -hmm. Games. Elected by all of his teammates uh, from all sports for that honor. I was almost two years old in the 1976 Games and after winning a bronze medal in the 100 fly, my father uh, took me from the stands and carried me around the pool deck in the medal uh, ceremony. Yeah. Um, so that was my first Olympic experience. <laughs> I, I was born into it. I, I, I've been swimming. Literally. I can remember uh, before I could walk. And uh, I'm one of six kids. Uh, we all swam. My maternal grandfather was the collegiate champion. He uh, um, served in World War II as a Navy uh, pilot and uh, came back. And when they didn't have the Olympics after the Olympic Games, I, after World War II, I'm sorry. He won the collegiate championships, which was the fastest swim meet in the world. His son, my maternal uncle, was on the 1976 Olympic team with my father. Uh, so a long line of uh, world-class swimmers. Oh, yeah, I can see how you got into it then. And all of your family, all of, all of the children, all your brothers, your sisters, or everyone swam. Yeah, you know, we uh, were, were, were very fortunate. Um, there was a, a home that we had in, in Florida, in, in the Bahamas. And uh, grew up swimming in those uh, the warm Atlantic waters, yeah. spear fishing, and that's where I fell in love with swimming. Uh, yeah. Long before I got into a pool or into a, a swim team environment, I kind of transitioned that love for all things aquatic. You know, yeah. being a waterman uh, yeah. first and foremost uh, in, into a swimming pool and in competitive swimming. Mm. I do love the ocean and I love the sea and I like swimming, but I'm, I can't say I'm a very good swimmer, but. I do like the ocean. <laughs> if, if the boat goes down, you either can or you can't. <laughs> I can swim, just not um, not not. not at, I wouldn't say at the uh, at a high level, but I can swim. Do you think there's it is like obviously there, people will say, "Oh, it's genetics." Do you think you were kind of born with special genetics a little bit, or would you just push that aside and say, "No, it's rubbish"? I would vehemently push that aside. I, I really resented uh, anyone that uses that excuse. Uh, that is a mindset, uh, uh, that's their problem. Yeah, uh, that yeah. happened there. Oh, I can't just beat him, he, he's, it's an intangible. Oh, he's more talented, I, I can't beat him. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's a cop out. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and, and so, no, it, you know, my, my parents wanted me in the sport because you can't hand off success, you have to earn it, you have to yeah. put in the advantage. There's no shortcuts absolutely. Um, to it compete at that level and, and, and you don't have to win an Olympic race or even get to the Olympics um, or a very high level of sport to really soak up the, the benefits of hard work, commitment, goal attainment, that type of stuff. And that's yeah. really what they wanted out of 
sport enrollment for yeah well i know you mentioned just a minute ago i don't want to forget this either spearfishing i did read something and i saw a video of you speaking to somebody else about spearfishing and an incident that happened i was going to leave it to the end but i think because you mentioned it and while we're at it tell us about the incident uh, i think it was 2006 uh, if i read correctly with your sister involved and and a shark spearfishing yeah. uh, is is something that we would do as a family my mother, my mother was in the boat along with my infant daughter. My sister and I were in the water. We were spearfishing. I speared a fish. It was carrying it back to the boat. There was a shark in the water that I was paying attention to, a black tip reef shark. And uh, I was watching that shark. Another shark came in, bit my sister in the arm, circled around her feet before I even saw it and started attacking me. I, I let go of the fish and the spear that was hoping that it would just go after the fish, but it didn't. Yeah. I, it was an altercation. I, I punched the shark repeatedly. <laughs> I, I wish that I, I, I could tell you that it, it, it stunned it or did anything. It did not. It just seemed to make it mad. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So uh, some thrashing around and, and um, scary. It was. Uh, it all happens real fast. And I've had close calls. You know, growing up spearfishing, there's always going to be sharks in the water. You're never right. too far. And uh, I've had plenty of. Uh, incidents where you know a shark would come in and take the fish off the spear or something like that yeah uh, but uh, this one was uh, definitely a, an adrenaline booster how did you feel what was going through your head when it happened you know when you spend that much time in growing up spearfishing you always have a plan like being okay. here you expect like, oh, it. gouge their eyes with your thumbs yeah and, and or punch it in the nose or you know you don't have time for a plan I, when something like that happens it all happens yeah. so fast you only have time to react and so it's very primal uh you know there's some primal screaming going on and, and, and it's a fight or flight response and mm -hmm. you know when, when you're put into a situation like that fight comes real easy scary though right must have uh, got your heart thumping in the moment you get you have to remain calm and you know mm -hmm. fortunately i was able to keep my head about me and you know, not panic that only excites them mm -hmm. more but uh, certainly all that blood in the water, uh, they, they start frenzying. And, it, you know, yeah. I, I, we had to jab them off of us, uh, you know, getting back to the boat. I'd like to talk about your training. And um, I'm, I'm assuming there were days that you didn't want to train or I'm assuming this. I know you shouldn't assume, but I know for a lot of athletes, there's days you're going to have good days and you have bad days. You wake up and you're like, oh, do I want to do this again today? Well, you need a break but you had to go and train. Were there, were there days like that? Absolutely. I, I, this is human nature, you know, yeah. uh, human brain, you know, <laughs> remaining in a comfort zone, taking yourself outside of that comfort zone. Um, it's a worthwhile endeavor. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we all have that. It's not, that's not exclusive to sport. We've all yeah. had, you know, if you have a job, you know, there's days yeah. that you, even if you love your job, you don't yeah. want to go in committed. I don't even consider it a sacrifice really. I mean, there was a lot of sacrifices along the way, but that's just part of what it takes to be successful in anything yeah. in life. What was it? What did you do to get yourself motivated? Small steps take us to great places. Every day starts with throwing your legs over the side of the bed and strapping on your shoes. Right? Yeah. Like, hopefully after you put on some pants, but you, know. <laughs> well, you don't have to. But yeah. <laughs> That's the way you get to the top of the Olympic podium. You know, one lap, not just one lap at a time, one stroke at a time, you know, and yeah. doing these little incremental improvements. With your, when was it that you uh, were diagnosed with diabetes? When did that come into play when you were in your career with swimming? I had competed in the 1996 Olympics. That was my first. I was 24 when I was diagnosed with type one autoimmune disease, not the lifestyle uh, more related to kind of being overweight or inactive. Mm -hmm. And uh, came out of nowhere, no family history of it. Life deals an assortment mm -hmm. of challenges. And that is yeah. part of the reason why I so much like the Olympic Games is because, you know, the profiles, the stories that you read, the little television vignettes, each athlete has overcome incredible adversity, stood bravely to face terrible odds you know, <laughs> and, and uh, have prevailed, uh, you know, and, and, and triumphed. And, and that's what inspires us. That's what makes the Olympic Games so popular. Yeah, you know, three point some billion people are watching yeah. uh, the, the games and, and, and taking something away from it. You know, there's mm -hmm. there's a story uh, somewhere in there that is sure to inspire. Yeah, yeah. So when you found out 
how did it affect what you were doing? So uh, when I was diagnosed, I was told by two doctors that it was the end of my swimming career, that it was right, impossible okay. to compete at that level of sport. Mm -hmm. um, and I had to take their word for it. Um, yeah. Initially, initially, I, I've never been a great listener, I guess, uh, especially <laughs> with instructions and stuff like that. I, it wasn't long before I kind of got this crazy idea that if I'm able to take really, really, really good care of my diabetes and keep it within a normal range, I can continue doing the normal things that I was doing before I was diagnosed. And uh, that's a challenge. That's a real challenge to do that. It's very, very, very difficult living with this chronic condition. Some of those qualities that had been instilled by sport, you know, and, and, and uh, what were applied, I, I couldn't have done it without two people and, and it was nice to have that support uh the first being uh a, a more positive endocrinologist a woman by the name of dr ann peters okay she's now at the usc keck school of medicine but she was the one that said hey let's give it a try mm -hmm. and um that emboldened me enough to get back into the water and start training everything had to change Mm -hmm. And so that leads to the second person that was really responsible in my support team. And that was my coach, Mike Bottom, who graduated near top of his class in psychology, uh, really was a genius in, in, in ways of motivating his uh, swimmers okay. and took a different technique in, in each approach because each personality required it. No two of us are built the same in, in, yeah. in what motivates us exactly. And so he was willing to work with me and have that ability to pivot and, and, and change the way I was training. And it's neat. I never could have expected it that devastating day when I sat in a doctor's office and was diagnosed. The things that we did changed what is being taught in medical school and how to manage okay. type 1 diabetes. Yeah. Building a wheel all over again. You know, it was, a, you know, really had to like just reevaluate and, and play it by ear and make adjustments along the way day to day. So what advice would you give to people that are listening that um, maybe have been diagnosed with diabetes and, and they're into sports? Yeah, so that was uh, another unintended consequence was, look, the Olympics is really neat because you get to represent your country. And yeah. So few athletes, so few people have that ability. I mean, we have professional teams, they represent a city, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. or maybe a state, yeah. um, you know, but to represent the whole, add on top of that layer, mm -hmm. um, to represent all people with diabetes. Mm -hmm. That, that too, I, it was, was uh, it, an honor um, and a responsibility that, that I did not take lightly. One it is it's silver linings, you know, yeah, like the, yeah. that, that was definitely a silver lining. Being able to make that diagnosis a little bit less scary uh, for yeah. a kid, a newly diagnosed kid and their family, mm -hmm. um, that kid, you know, if they're involved in sport or not, can know now through example, and, and not just from myself, there's so many other athletes yeah. that have come yeah, yeah. since yeah. that have done incredible achievements in sport. It's up to them, you know, how, how aggressive can they be in managing the disease and keeping it in check? And, and are you willing to put in the work and, and, and apply yourself. And, and if you are, the sky's the limit. You can yeah. be the best, the, the fastest swimmer in the world, at least. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what sort of things are we talking here? Um, diet, um, I'm assuming one of the things on there, is it? Very important, yes. Yeah. For everybody, uh, with or without any uh, chronic condition. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what, what are the key factors for diabetes, especially for somebody who's, who wants to compete at a high level? in any sport um, or just ge in general anyway, but. Type one diabetes is an autoimmune disease where my immune system starts attacking the beta cells in my pancreas. Mm -hmm. They produce insulin, which breaks down the food that we eat uh, into an energy that we can use. Yep. Uh, if I don't have those cells, the sugar builds up in my bloodstream, it coagulates, it gets sticky and thick and you have a stroke or a seizure, um, you, you die uh, pretty quick. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and, and so uh, the invention of insulin came around in 1923, uh, doctors Banting and Best uh, out of Canada, um, and, and that was a game changer and allowed people that died previously to live. And so um, to this day, we still need insulin to live. 
Yeah. Um, so that means multiple injections on a sliding scale um, daily, um, every day, a day, uh, multiple times a day, uh, basically in coordinates with the carbohydrate intake. That, so um, if I eat more carbohydrates, more insulin. So if your blood sugar remains high, I described that, the, the, the adverse effect of insulin is that it's a very powerful hormone. If you give yourself too much, your blood sugar goes low, you can go into a coma and die. It, that kills a lot of people uh, with type 1 diabetes mm -hmm. uh, every year. Um, and, and so that's something that you just have to be constantly vigilant about. You know, the kids and, and adults that have type 1 diabetes, it's always in somewhere near the forefront of their, their thoughts. Yeah. With the diabetes, then where I am in India, um, in India in general, I know stats are quite high here as a country. Diabetes is very high here. Is there is there a way to control it to have less insulin if you've got your diet right? Because I've I've done a lot of reading on it, but I say a yeah. lot, sorry, not a lot, but I've done some reading on it, and I, I you hear stories of people that have have got themselves have dropped down so from type one to the one below where they don't have to have as much insulin and stuff is that type two diabetes, which is more lifestyle related and accounts for about 95, 90, 95% of the world's diabetes population. Yeah. Uh, the predominant uh, one everywhere, not just India, you can scale back the medications. Typically they'll put people um, that are, have poorly controlled type two diabetes. That's the adult onset, what was formerly known as adult onset diabetes. Um, they can, you know, go off of insulin onto oral medications. Um, and, and so there's some improvement and there's people that have lost a lot of weight, uh, watch what they eat. They exercise regularly and are able to get themselves off all med uh, diabetes, uh, medications entirely. Um, I don't have that option as type one diabetes, but exercise is important, uh, particularly for those with type two diabetes. What's really discouraging for a lot of people with uh, diabetes type one or type two, is that when they do, you know, th their doctor will recommend exercise. Yep. Um, exercise is medicine is a new campaign uh, by the American College of Sports Medicine here in the United States. If there was a drug that had the efficacy of exercise yep. um, and the benefits of exercise, every doctor in the world would prescribe that drug. And so more and more doctors are getting comfortable, not, prescribing, I'm doing quotation marks on, uh, on that, because uh, it, it is part of disease management, um, especially the uh, numbers that uh, people that are dealing with obesity or type 2 diabetes. What would be your advice to anyone that's, again, this not for people that specifically looking to go to the Olympics, what would be your best bit of advice you'd give them in terms of getting to the top of the level they want to get to? Because not everyone yeah. wants to go to the Olympics or a lot of people are never going to get there. Um, yeah. And, and that's totally fine. Uh, you know, you can, when you swim fast at the Olympics, you meet so many interesting people, successful people in, in business and sport, entertainment, politics. And anyone that I've met uh, that is successful weren't obsessed with being the best. They were obsessed with being better. Right? And not yeah. better than the person next to them and the next cubicle or, you know, the corner office yeah. uh, or the lane next to them or you know, the Compete. other side of the court. Comparison. I That's right. The, the better, better than where I was yesterday. Yeah. How, how do I improve? And again, it goes back to these small steps, these incremental, like yeah. that obsession with constantly striving to be just a little bit better, just a little yeah. bit better. Yeah. Um, That's what it takes. That's what yeah. it takes to be successful. Um, in sport and everything else. Mm -hmm. Was there anyone that you ever competed against? You don't need to mention any names that you feel maybe had the wrong mindset where they were, they were still talented and good, but they were trying to compare themselves against the other athletes rather than improving themselves. Yeah. You know, the mind is active. It, it changes from day to day. And so, you know, a lot of times you have very confident, uh, capable, athletes yeah uh, physically capable of winning the olympic games anybody in the finals of the uh, at the olympic games is physically capable of winning mm -hmm. and that the difference between yeah. those on the medal podium and, and those you know that that aren't that that's um 
the mind. That's the mind. Yeah. Um, that's the mindset that, that differentiates them. Yeah. And so that's what's difficult uh, is, is to maintain the mindset and, and, and uh, confidence, level of confidence that is required to do well. And, and when I say confidence, you have to be willing to fail. You have to be okay with that risk, no matter what the odds are, yeah. uh, in order to be successful. Yeah. And, and so walking into a ready room, a small room that they put the finalists in before we're walked out to the starting blocks of the Olympic games. Uh -huh. um, I could look into the eyes of the competitors and immediately eliminate three or four of the finalists because it, it, it's easy to be shaken. Those that are able to maintain the mindset in that pressure cooker situation uh -huh. uh, are the ones that triumph. I like the fact you've mentioned being brave. I think it's something that holds a lot of people, well, it's not bravery, but the fear holds a lot of people back, sometimes even starting something. And um, even when they could be good at something, they don't, they decide not to do it because they're scared. They're scared of failure or they're scared of something, you know. And a lot of times it's subconscious. Human beings have a tendency to self-destruct or sabotage. Yeah. Um, in, in these situations for fear of, I, I, I don't know. The human mind is fascinating. It's something that we know so little about. Yeah, uh, the best of us, the smartest of us, yeah. um, you know, we're only beginning to understand what's really happening inside the human brain and, and, and you know, what makes us tick uh, yeah. in this way. So yeah. uh, it, it, it's uh, fascinating. And, and, and that's, you know, there's, there's so many sports psychologists that gravitate to the Olympic Games and, and want to use these athletes as a lab rat. Yeah. Uh, for their uh, testing, uh, for testing, and, and understand, you know, why you've got <clears throat> a group of 100 athletes uh, on, on any given swim team, and they all do the exact same workout. They're all eating healthy. They're all committed. They're all trained to visualize and, and do all the preparation stuff. You know, why does one person excel at the end of the season? Yeah, when another falters. What's the what's some of the what's the best bit of advice you've ever been given? Because I'm sure you've been given a lot of advice and support as well. You know. Yeah, you know, my, I mentioned at the beginning, my father was a successful uh, Olympian. He never won an individual gold medal. He he held you know ten world records. He was favored to win ten world Olympic records. Games. Uh, yeah, um, and he was favored you know multiple times in multiple events uh, to win, and. I, I remember as a, being very young and, and watching the race footage from the Olympic Games where my father competed yeah. and seeing him behind uh, the starting blocks. It was the look that I see in the eyes of others where I said in the ready room, I'm able to right, like okay. dismiss. Um, that happened to him. He won two silvers and a bronze. It's hardly a bad job. You know, <laughs> but certainly the not medal evaded him. I learned from that, even if it wasn't him saying, so it, the only advice that he gave me through my entire career wasn't on how to do a better flip turn or a better start or a better hand entry or something like that. He would always say, have fun. What that meant was be present, mm -hmm. enjoy the moment. And I felt like I was able to do that. And, and that's what differentiated me from him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and so, um, yeah, that's, you know, the, the hard work um, and, and having fun are not exclusive. High pressure situations, uh, you know, you're still able to have fun, be present, enjoy the moment mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in situations that, that are high pressure. Yeah. And so, yeah, just, you know, try to, try to shake out the nerves as, as much as you can. I know it's yeah. not easy. Yeah, but you enjoyed it. I mean, you you've got a serious passion for swimming as well, and being in that, like you said at the beginning, and um, you're just by the pool now, aren't you? You know, I just you you, it's, and I think that makes a massive difference if you, with anything that you do. You don't enjoy it. You just you won't be successful. Oh, yeah, and that's becomes, in everything. Everything you do. Yeah, yeah. there's got to be there's got to be passion and love for it. Um, what about uh, sacrifice when you were you know. Uh, training competing because you competed for such a long time as well it wasn't a short period of time is there anything you look back now and think you had because there, there would have definitely been sacrifice no doubt um even if you love it or not is there anything that you think was a sacrifice now looking back 
you all you had uh, to yeah i mean i didn't go to any like high school dances there was all yeah. you know it was always you know a swim meet that weekend okay um, and i don't regret that you know like um <laughs> but there are more sacrifices involved than the athletes know at the time uh just the way the american football players you know were sustaining these concussions and stuff like that now we understand okay there's there's that's collateral damage that is yeah. going to last a lifetime you're going to suffer a broken down body and or, or and or mind later in life uh the sacrifices are different uh is sport to sport um but most of the Olympic athletes, they know sacrifices. Most of those, nobody gets into swimming to achieve fame and fortune. You don't make a ton of money in, yeah. in swimming or wrestling or yeah. taekwondo or what Olympic diving, that type of stuff. The athletes are okay with that, but they don't understand the long-term detrimental effects. Of, of, I was 34 years old uh, when I kind of joined the real world, right? Like went out job application 2008 yeah. the economy was you know doldrums mm -hmm. uh and you know i was walking out and it, no matter how successful i was at the olympic level i still had a resume that said swimmer yeah yeah, yeah. 34 years old yeah you know and, and so um that transition i think there's more uh, light being shed on how difficult that transition is for all athletes um and having to reinvent yourself um readjust, uh, recalibrate expectations. And a lot of athletes have struggled with that terribly and they're forgotten about. Uh, there are no support systems, at least here in the United States, that assist these athletes in making that transition um, or preparing them how, uh, for how to do that. And so I think that the longer that you are in the sport, the more difficult it is. Um, and in a lot of ways, many of these athletes too they become like a, a machinist, right? A pull press. And they just do the same motion for 20, 25 years. And then they're asked to push a button instead of pull a lever. And it's just like mind blowing. They can't handle it. And it's tragic. It's tragic uh, yeah. when, when you see that happen. I, in some ways, we uh, talked earlier a little bit about the silver linings of a diabetes diagnosis. That set me on a path of uh, patient advocacy, which made my, not just a career transition, mm -hmm. much, much easier. It also gave me, it helped provide some identity that yeah. was sustained rather than not a swimmer anymore. Who am I? What is yeah. life? What is the meaning? Like where, what? <laughs> where do I fit? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Big questions. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting that you said that, you know, for those that are not competing, which again is the majority at that level, you just wouldn't, you don't think of that, do you? Because you see, you see people like yourself that are in the Olympics and competing, you're like, wow, you know. And then, yeah, there has to be a point where that stops. Let, let's talk about how you did transition then. You know, what did you uh, do that successfully? Well, the, the diabetes advocacy. So I, I, you know, because of it was running parallel to my swimming career. It was how I was supporting myself as a swimmer. 10 out of the 15 years that I competed for the national team, I had no income from the sport of swimming. And so it was only through the diabetes work that I was doing yeah. my job. Yeah. Uh, that I was able to maintain my swimming career and was doing nonprofit yep. and um, did a lot of years nonprofit, called a lot of favor through those years. Mm -hmm. And uh, because diabetes has become such a huge problem, such oh, a huge piece yeah. of our healthcare system, I was I graduated up through ranks, uh, raised a ton of money for diabetes research, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and just traveled you know, in the years after Olympics, you know, three cities a week uh, doing black tie events, you know, raising money for, for diabetes okay. research. And so through that networking and, um, you know, uh, that I was able to build up uh, enough of a network to leverage now as a, as a healthcare consultant mm -hmm. and, um, you know, assisting smaller companies and integrating them into larger health systems and ultimately wow. with the goal of, of continuing to help the patient, the end user, yeah, um, yeah. Whether these products, whether it's a medical device or a new pharmaceutical um, or, you know, cure-based therapies uh, you know, that we have been chasing down. I was early on board on the stem cell research, which is so, so, oh, okay. it's just yeah. taken 
a painstakingly long time to get over some of the hurdles, the kind of political stuff that would have kept it from being pursued at a more reasonable pace. So you were involved with some of that? With the, the support? Oh, yeah, with, very, yeah. very much so. Very ah. much so. It presented at stem cell conferences. Um, I, I wrote my first letter to a congressman here in the United States about mm -hmm. stem cell therapy in 1999. Been at that for a long time. How long has it been going on for now then? Not too much longer to the public purview. Uh, yeah. There's some therapies uh, like blood platelets and centrifuge spinning and that would activate some of these. So they were but they didn't understand why there was benefits to some of these therapies that they were mm. uh, conducting. Yeah. But yeah, it's been 25 years now, really, where it's been Molly the sheep. Uh, yeah, that okay. if you'll remember the, the clone sheep. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, there, we, there were fears that, you know, North Korea was going to clone a super army or, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, and, 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 or that it was an abortion issue. So we really had to like, you know, the scientific community really had to fight a lot of these unfounded, uh, you know, fears um, that uh, were, were in, in mainstream media. So to, you know, to have been part of that, you know, it definitely helps uh, with, with my career uh, path. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's not something you woke up and thought was going to happen, I suppose, is it? It's just... No, you know, sometimes our charities pick us, sometimes our careers pick us, you yeah. know, and, and so this is something, like I, like you said earlier, you know, you have to have that passion in order to be successful, and that's yeah. all it was for me, you know, initially it was just, you know, passion for years and years and years, and, and, and just, you know, just, and so uh, it, it, that passion is still, still there. Yeah. You know, being able to help patients, that's what I care about. Yeah, yeah, good for you. Um, look, before we wrap up, I know you got the rest of the day. Um, I, you're in California, aren't you? I think, yeah. I am. Sun, yeah, sun is shining. Full yeah. side. <laughs> um, any last words of wisdom to any not just not just athletes, but anybody that wants to be successful with something they decide to do, whether that is business, uh, whether it is sports, um charity what what would be your 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 words of advice sure i got one yeah yeah like and that. everything you do care and, and you'll you'll be a better family member a better teacher mentor to others you'll inspire others yeah you, you have each one of us has this potential right mm -hmm. to, to to make a difference yeah. and it, it starts here and it starts with real small steps uh, on, on self-improvement, self-awareness, um, but ultimately care, care for others, mm. care for yourself, care for what you're doing. And if you're able to do that, not only can you be happier in life, you can, you can make a big difference yeah. in, the, in the lives of many, many people. Yeah. You don't hear people say that very often. Take it, take it from a tough guy. Yeah. <laughs> but firstly, I'd just like to say thank you for your time, Gary. It's been an absolute honor have somebody who's achieved so much um a just in incredible career and with everything that you're doing with the diabetes and helping others as well with it just is, is incredible it, who how can people reach out to you if they wanted to speak to you about the diabetes specifically you know and you know for help yeah, you can track me down i think everybody's on instagram these days i think my handle is at gary hall dot junior jr okay. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Good luck, everybody. Have fun. If you'd like to reach out to Gary, then we have left links in the description. This has been Richard Rosser and Gary Hall Jr. Peace out. Mm -hmm.